Well, good evening and welcome to the second installment of the Hagen History Center Spring 2021 Speaker Series. I'm Jeff Sherry, Museum Educator at the Hagen History Center. Our speakers tonight are Mr. George Deitch and Mr. Brian Graff, who will discuss their research on the United States Colored Troops, or USCT, during the American Civil War. Before I turn it over to our presenters, just a few announcements from the Hagen History Center. We are currently closed to the public due to the pandemic, but we are working to complete new exhibits at our new exhibit building, as well as those in the Watson Curtsy Mansion and the Wood Morrison House on our West 6th Street campus. We plan to be open in late spring of this year. Our staff has created many blogs and videos that are available on our website at www.eriehistory.org, and we encourage you to check those out regularly. Tonight's speakers will talk about the story of Northwest PA's participation in the Civil War, which is well known to those who study local history. The names of Strong Vincent, John McLean are emblazoned on schools, highways, and bridges, even if many are not aware of what they, that they are amongst thousands who answered the call to serve as volunteers in the Union Army. The common distinction that runs through the Pennsylvanians and those from almost every other Northern state who served was that state, state, the state organized the regiments and they were exclusively white. Starting in 1863, the service of men of African descent was in federalized units, but their recruitment often came through local centers. This is the virtually unknown story of how over 300 black men joined the Union Army here in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And what was their fate? George Deitch, historian and author, is the executive director of the Erie County Historical Society, returning to Erie in June, 2016. Over the last four years, ECHS has experienced significant growth under Deitch's leadership, purchasing and restoring two historic buildings and constructing the new exhibit building on its Hagen History Center campus. He has published several articles on the Civil War's 83rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry and Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry's flagship Niagara from the War of 1812. During the Civil War sesquicentennial, he was a contributor to the map supplement of the National Geographic issue of the Civil War. Deitch is a leader in, the histor in historic preservation and multiple public history projects co-founding the flagship Niagara League in 1980 and serving for many years on the Board of Trustees. That organization championed the reconstruction of Niagara, now Pennsylvania's official flagship, and the creation of the Erie Maritime Museum. He also spent several years on the Erie County Historical Society Board of Directors and co-founded both the Erie Civil War Roundtable and the Erie County Civil War Consortium, a nonprofit educational organization. Deitch helped to lead the efforts to restore and preserve Erie County Civil War Monument in Perry Square <clears throat> and Erie related monuments on the Gettysburg Battlefield, and to conserve the two Civil War battle flags now in the Heritage Room at Erie's Blasco Library. Deutsch designed the wayside marker on Gettysburg's little round top depicting Strong Vincent and Joshua Chamberlain. He annually teaches history courses at Chautauqua Institution in New York, is a regular lecturer for the Jefferson Education Society in Erie, and has led dozens of battlefield tours for roundtable and university groups. He's honored twice by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission and received the Local History Award in 2003 from the Erie County Historical Society. Deutsch has a degree in history from Mercyhurst University and also was educated at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Currently, he is writing a new book on the famous 83rd Pennsylvania Infantry, focusing on the untold history of the last year of the Civil War. Brian Graff is a retired federal employee who moved to Erie from Washington, DC in 2016. As a geographer for the government, he had a varied career with service at the Defense Mapping Agency, the U.S. Census Bureau, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Mr. Graff earned a BA in geography at Florida Atlantic University in 1981 
and an MA in geography at the University of Illinois in 1983, and an MS in strategic services from the Joint Military Intelligence College in 2006. His master's thesis earned the 2005-2006 Fleet Admiral Chester W. Nimitz Award for excellence in archival research. Since coming to Erie, Mr. Graff has volunteered at various organizations, one of which is the Erie County Historical Society. It was while volunteering at the Historical Society that Mr. Graff performed archival research on the recruitment of black soldiers in Northwest Pennsylvania. I'll turn it over to George and Brian. Thank you, Jeff. And I believe, uh, Brian, you're gonna uh, pull up our slides here. Good, all right. Um, all right, so tonight's lecture, the recruitment of black soldiers for the Union Army in Northwestern Pennsylvania, 1863 and 1865. Well, in 1995, I purchased a set, no, go back one, we're not quite ready for that one yet. Um, I purchased a set of documents of a Civil War paymaster from Erie. Later, when I closely reviewed them, I discovered that the muster roll records that I had purchased um, contained two regiments from the United States Colored Troops and contained numerous names of men enlisted in Northwestern Pennsylvania, Waterford, Erie County, City of Erie, and Meadville in Crawford County. This was a real surprise because I knew that the black population here at the time was very small. I checked the census records and verified that there were only around 40 men of African descent of military age living here according to the 1860 count. What, I, what had I stumbled upon? Was there a large population living here off the books? Like any hypo hypothesis, it needed to be tested and proven or disproven. Life put research on the back burner for a long time. Before I moved away a few years later, I did um, donate copies of the uh, uh, records to the Erie County Historical Society. And, la and after a long hiatus, I returned to Erie to become the executive director of the society and decided to dust off the research project. After doing some preliminary research at the National Archives, I began to sense that this would be a bigger and more complex story than I had originally supposed. That's when I knew I'd need more time than I could possibly devote. Fortunately, I discovered that Brian Graff, at the time one of our new volunteers, had an interest in knack for research. So I persuaded him to meet me in DC for a research trip, where he ended up spending an additional week at the archives. I'd really unleashed a tiger on this project. Most of what you'll see tonight is the product of Brian's long hours of dedicated research and analysis. Spoiler alert, uh, we didn't discover some large underground community, but the story we did develop turns out to be fascinating nonetheless. What you'll hear tonight just scratches the surface of our research. There are many dozens of stories of men of color who joined the Union Army to fight for freedom, citizenship, and the right to vote. Their stories shot out for a major scholarly paper a master's thesis, or even a dissertation. Brian, go ahead, next slide. So the outline tonight uh, will include a brief history of recruiting black soldiers in the Union Army. Uh, it'll provide a background on raising black regiments in Pennsylvania. It'll describe our archival research on black soldiers for the United States Colored Troops in, their, in uh, regiments out of Northwestern Pennsylvania. Other Northwestern, uh, Men of color joined the Navy uh, and the steamer Michigan home port in Erie became an important recruiting vessel. And finally, we'll talk about the PA Soldier and Sailors Home where uh, many former USCT veterans were housed. Um, this is one man um, who, by the name of Isham Hayes, um, uh, who uh, was recruited in uh, June of 64 from Waterford, PA. Next. This is a man that uh, many of you should recognize, Frederick Douglass. Douglass was a true force of nature. During the Civil War, um, Douglass, a former slave and ardent abolitionist, was a major uh, advocate of uh, recruiting black men to fight for the Union. He played a critical role in shaping the political debate over black military service. He's been quoted many times on that subject, but this quote best captures his argument. 
Once let the black man upon his person, the brass letters US, let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there's no power on earth or under the earth that can deny he has earned the right to citizenship. And that quote came from April of 1863. Next. What were the barriers to having um, black men in the army? Well, first of all, of course, uh, the vast majority were still enslaved um, by 1860. At the beginning of the Civil War in April 1861, there, were, there was no provision to allow black men to serve in the army. The Militia Act of, eight, of 1792 was a barrier. It provided for the organization of state militias and the service of every, quote, free, able-bodied white male citizen between the ages of 18 and 45. Black men were barred from serving in those militias. Um, there, this was the law of the land going into the Civil War. So even though there were many free black men in the North who were willing to serve, they were prohibited. Next. Um, the movement to field black troops was very slow for the first couple of years of the war. In uh, 1861 and early 1862, there were a few senior unit officers who acted on their own initiative to declare slaves free and promote their enlistment. The first was Major General Benjamin the Beast Butler, named so the Beast by the women of New Orleans. He was a prominent Massachusetts politician and abolitionist. Um, early on, he was the commander at Fortress Monroe on the tip of the Virginia Peninsula on the lower Chesapeake Bay. He took in and protected hundreds of slaves who had run away from nearby plantations and refused to return them to their owners. He labeled them as contrabands of war, essentially seized property of those supporting the rebellion, contrabands. The Confiscation Act of 1861 was an attempt to set a consistent policy throughout the army. It was an act of Congress permitting court proceedings for confiscation of any property used to support the Confederacy, including slaves. Later in August 1861, General John Fremont, commander of the Union Army of the West, declared martial law in Missouri and threatened to free black slaves of rebel sympathizers. This was a problem since Missouri, while a slave holding state, was still part of the Union. Lincoln was not willing to alienate the population of a border state he was trying to hold into the Union. Fremont was reprimanded for this act, his order revoked, and he was removed from command. In May 1862, General David Black Dave Hunter, appropriately named for his support of black uh, men, um, uh, who was the commander of the military department of Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida, issued an order freeing all slaves in those areas under his command and suggesting raising black regiments of former slaves. This order was countermanded, returning the slaves to the former status in care of the federal government. Next. Why did the Lincoln administration revoke these early efforts to free slaves and raise black regiments? Take a look at the map. There are several reasons. After the fall of Fort Sumter in April of 1861 and President Lincoln's call for Union troops to put down the rebellion, four more Southern states succeeded, those are the ones in yellow there, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. However, there are four more states, all slaveholding, that stayed in the Union. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. The number of slaves in those states was roughly 430,000, about 10% of the total slave population in the country at the time. Lincoln knew that he couldn't afford to alienate any of those four states. Thus, freeing slaves and the creation of, of black regiments were not practical policies at the time. While Northern abolitionists were very vocal in their desire to free slaves, Lincoln knew that there was much division in the North on the freeing of slaves. Even if the slaves were freed, what was to be done with them? Also, racism was common in Northern states, and most of the men in the Union Army were truly fighting to preserve the Union, not to free slaves. So early on, there was not universal or even widespread sentiment in the North for emancipation. Next. <clears throat> 
we did have some key steps along the way as the war progressed um, towards the enlistment of black troops. In July 1862, Congress passed two landmark acts. The Militia Act of 1862 empowered the president to enroll, enroll quote, persons of Af African descent for any war service for which they may be found competent. This was including service as soldiers. This essentially avoided the Militia Act of 1792, but a significant um, component of this uh, act was to um, set lower pay for black men than white soldiers. This reflected the widespread expectation that blacks would be used for labor only, freeing the white troops for combat. Plus, um, this was still a state administered system and most, most Northern states had no interest in enlisting black soldiers. So the act actually failed in practice. The Confiscation Act of 1862 contained the first definite provisions for freeing slaves in the Confederate States. Southerners who were deemed traitors were to be punished by having their slaves confiscated and freed. The most significant change of the first Confiscation Act was the final status of escaped slaves. Well, the first act did not make any determination on the final status after the war was over. The second act explicitly said that all slaves covered under it would be permanently freed. The Second Confiscation Act also prohibited anyone in the military from returning escaped slaves, even those that has, had escaped from the Union, from Union states that still had legal slavery. The Second Act prepared the way legally for the Emancipation Proclamation and settled the problem about, about what the Army should do with slaves in their jurisdictions. The Act also empowered Lincoln to, quote, employ as many persons of African descent as he may deem necessary and proper for the suppression of the rebellion and organize and use them in such manner as he may judge best for the public welfare. A broad interpretation would include enlisting them in the army. However, Lincoln did not act on this provision immediately. Next. Now we come to the Emancipation Proclamation, um, something that um, most of, of uh, every school child learns about. It was created by Lincoln as a War Powers Act, effective only through the end of hostilities. And today, it's widely misunderstood. Specifically, it freed slaves only in areas still in rebellion, since Lincoln believed that he didn't have the constitutional authority to seize the property of law-abiding citizens. Additionally, increasingly, additionally, the increasingly large numbers of freed slaves or contrabands had to be dealt with more systematically. These former slaves whose service uh, once worked for the benefit of the Confederacy could not possibly be used by the Union. One of the key provisions of the Emancipation Proclamation was a new national policy of enlisting men of African descent into military service. Lincoln uh, in the proclamation says, and I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. This was truly a game changer for the war and the path to black citizenship. Brian, up, uh, your turn. Thank you, George. Okay, hold on. After the Emancipation Proclamation, the first black regiment started to form primarily in occupied areas of the South. Three came from Louisiana, one from South Carolina, and one from Kansas. And in the North, the 54th Massachusetts was formed as portrayed in the 1989 film, Glory. Frederick Douglass was recruited for the 54th Massachusetts and two of his sons enlisted. Recruiting extended for free black men into Pennsylvania, especially Philadelphia. There were actually more men who came from Pennsylvania, over 300, than Massachusetts, 133. Other Northern states were slower to embrace creating black regiments, but black regiments faced formidable obstacles. For example, they originally paid less than white troops. This was not resolved until June 15, 1864, when the Federal Congress granted equal pay for all soldiers. So this was about a year and a half after the first uh, black regiments were, were formed. 
There was also initial skepticism among some senior officers about how to uh, utilize these new black regiments. Could they really be used in combat or should they be relegated to fatigue duty? Finally, in April 1863, the Confederate Congress passed a joint resolution calling for one, the execution of white officers captured leading black regiments for inciting servile insurrection, and two, the re-enslavement of black soldiers captured in battle. While this was never enacted on a large scale by the Confederacy, Confederate officers on the ground sometimes established their own policies, such as refusing to take black soldiers as prisoners. But recruiting continued. General Lorenzo Thomas was sent west to raise black regiments in the freed portions of the Confederate states of Tennessee, Mississippi, Georgia, and he had good success. Most importantly, in May 1863, the government established the Bureau of Colored Troops to manage the growing numbers of black soldiers. Black regiments formed under the purview of the Bureau of Colored Troops would not have state designations. These regiments would be designated as U.S. Colored Troops, USCT for short. For example, the first USCT regiment mustered in Pennsylvania was the third USCT, not the Pennsylvania third USCT. <clears throat> As we have seen in 1863, the recruitment of black soldiers began in earnest. At the same time, manpower shortages in the Northern Army forced the government to initiate a draft or conscription. This confluence of events helped to drive the recruitment of black soldiers, and this is why. Enlistment quotas were established for each state. These quotas would then be broken down by congressional district, and then counties within districts, and finally townships. Recruitment of troops during the draft was administered through congressional districts, and we're going to see how this applied to Northwest Pennsylvania in just a few minutes. Now, drafts would not be necessary in those areas where volunteers filled the quotas. The government provided incentives for volunteers in the form of bounties or bonuses upon enlistment. The standard federal bounty was $300 for a three-year enlistment term. If not enough volunteers came forward and a citizen was drafted, he still had the option of purchasing his way out for $300, which was called commutation, or hiring a substitute. The recruitment of black volunteers was seen as a way to fill these quotas and a, a, a way to avoid or minimize the draft. Black men were thus recruited heavily in the freed areas of the Confederacy and later in the border states. Black men received federal and local bounties and served as substitutes. And local free black men were eligible to be drafted, same as white men. And uh, here's an example of results of a draft held in Erie County on August 25th, 1863. So we can see that for this draft, Erie County did not meet the quotas and was forced to perform a draft. Again, not all of these men would be drafted. They could file for exemptions, pay the $300 or find a substitute. Now, the contributions of black soldiers. It is difficult to estimate exactly how many black men served in Union regiments. 179,000 is the most commonly used estimate, but in recent years, the estimates have grown as high as 200,000. A rough estimate is that they comprised about 10% of the Union Army. 175 USCT regiments were formed. The black troops took part in roughly 450 separate engagements. Much of this occurred in the later part of the war, 1864 to 1865, when Union casualties were extremely high and war weariness was becoming a factor. USCT regiments played a major role in the Port Hudson campaign, the Battle of the Crater at Petersburg, Virginia, and the Battle of Alusti in Florida. 25 Medal of Honor recipients were black men. The black regiments lost a lot of men, 38,000 deaths or 21% of the force. However, 19.4% of the casualties were disease related. Medical treatment of the black regiments was considered substandard. For black troops, the ratio was nine to one of disease related deaths versus combat related deaths. For white troops, the ratio was five to three of disease related deaths versus combat related deaths. And now we're gonna talk about raising the black regiments in Pennsylvania. Government Curtain of Pennsylvania was authorized in June, 1863 to begin raising black regiments. From 1863 to 1865, Pennsylvania put 11 regiments in the field. Since Pennsylvania started a bit later than other Northern states, already over 1,000 black men from Pennsylvania had enlisted in other states. As a result, Pennsylvania actively recruited black men from other states to enlist in its 11 black regiments. 
This worked well since Pennsylvania mustered more black men than any other union non-slave state. The number of black men credited to Pennsylvania was 8,612. Ohio was second with 5,092. And Kentucky as a union slave state was number one overall with 23,703 men. As I've said, recruitment of the troops during the draft was administered through congressional districts. And here is a map showing the 25 congressional districts of Pennsylvania during the Civil War. Uh, this is for the 38th Congress from March 4th, 1863 uh, through March 3rd, 1865. And we're gonna zoom in a bit closer now using the 19th Congressional District as an example each congressional district was won by a provost marshal out of a headquarters. The 19th headquarters was in Waterford. Many provost marshals were former union officers who had to leave active service due to wounds. Our provost marshal was one of these. Hugh Campbell, formerly the 83rd Pennsylvania Volunteer Regiment, was badly wounded at Second Bull Run in 1862. By all accounts, he was an able and fair provost marshal. Under the provost marshal would be an enrolling commissioner, a position to do the physicals of recruits, and a recruiting officer. Matt Schlaudecker, formerly of the 111th Pennsylvania Volunteer Regiment, served as a recruiting officer. All men, black or white, were run through the Provost Marshal's office in Waterford, but after they enlisted, they were sent to different training camps. And Camp William Penn is where the black uh, troops went. Once black men were enlisted or drafted, they were transported to Camp William Penn for training. This camp was fully functional by July 1863 and was located in Shelton Hills, just north of Philadelphia. All 11 USCT regiments trained at Camp William Penn, which amounted to about 11,000 men. This camp was the largest training facility for black troops in the United States and the only camp built specifically for this purpose. This 1864 lithograph shows the layout. No trace of the camp remains, but a roadside marker commemorates Camp William Penn. Colonel Lewis Wagner was the commander of the camp and strongly abolitionist. By all accounts, he ran a disciplined camp and took seriously the training of the men who came under his purview. Like the Provost Marshal of the 19th District, he was also wounded at Second Bull Run in 1862. What was the training like at Camp William Penn? The training matched the standard military training of white troops. In the morning, companies trained individually, and in the afternoon, the regiment was trained as a unit. The program was intensive and directed by Colonel Wagner, his staff, and regimental officers. When these regiments left camp, they were well-trained. Here's a picture of the 25th USCT uh, in formation at Camp William Penn. The graduation ceremonies were grand affairs. Guest speakers at regiment graduations included Frederick Douglass at the third USC graduation in July, 1863, and Harriet Tubman in April 1865 for the 24th USCT. Regimental flags were also presented at these ceremonies. And here is the regimental flag for the 24th USCT, the regiment that Harriet Tubman spoke to at graduation. And it says, let soldiers in war be citizens in peace. A very colorful flag. And now we're gonna report on the research that George was talking about earlier. This was sort of setting up the context for, for the research. Um, we wanted to understand the number and backgrounds of the black men who enlisted in Northwest PA into the USCT regiments. Thus we collected data from primary sources on the USCT men who enlisted or were drafted in the city of Erie, Waterford, or Meadville, and that were credited to Erie, Warren, Crawford, Mercer, or Venango counties. The map shows the geographic extent of our study. And as you can see, these five counties span two different congressional districts and were both administered by their own provost marshals. And let's just talk a little bit about the, uh, the primary sources that we used to collect the information uh, for this study. Uh, we started with uh, the muster rolls that George talked about. We started with the muster rolls for the 43rd USCT. And these were used to extract the names of men who enlisted in either Erie, Waterford, or Meadville. We didn't have the muster rolls for the other regiments, the other 10 regiments. So we used Fold 3, an online source of military records that contained the scanned service records for every soldier that served in a USCT regiment. So by regiment, we looked at the service record of each soldier to see where they enlisted. For those who enlisted in Northwest PA, we collected data on these men. 
And this was a very labor intensive task and it, it took months. Um, and I can, George and I can vouch for that. Uh, we then collected pension records for those men who were credited to Erie County that had pension records. The pension records are stored at the National Archives in Washington, DC. We made a trip there to make digital copies of these records. Pension records are a very useful source for fleshing out the stories of these soldiers. They often contain accounts of how the men came to enlist in the army, their service experiences, and glimpses of their home life. Sometimes if we're lucky, we even got a photograph as this one of, of George Dallas. And the other photograph that we saw earlier in the presentation was also gotten from, from pension records. Uh, medical records were collected at National Archives. These were important to the story since illness and disease are a, a big part of the SCT story. And we also used local newspapers uh, that were researched on microfilm at the Heritage Room at the Blasco Library. And just really wanna compliment the staff at the library for all their help with that. They were, they were extremely helpful. And now for uh, the, the results of what the research um, entailed, we, here's what we found. Uh, 286 men uh, were enlisted or drafted, 205 in Waterford, 78 in Meadville, and three in Erie. Thus, 70% of the men enlisted in Waterford. The average age of the men was 25.2 years old. This is comparable to white troops. The youngest recorded man was 18, the oldest 44. And there were 27 unique occupations listed in their service records. Two by four, far were the most common, laborer and farmer. 57% of, of the men were laborers and 24% were farmers. Together, these occupations account for 21%, I'm sorry, 81% of the occupations. The next most common occupations were barber, cook, and boatman. And here's a graph that uh, just shows the number of men by occupation. You can definitely see uh, the heavy weighting towards laborer and farmer. But again, if you look at the, the wide swath of different types of occupations, there, there's quite a, a, a bit of variety there. Okay. Here's a graph that shows the number of men who enlisted each month. We can see the numbers were very low in 1863. Here we go, 1863 and in 1865. Most of the men came aboard uh, from January 1864 to October 1864. Peak month was June 1864 when over 50 men uh, enlisted in the 45th USCT. And I like this, this chart, it's sort of interesting because you can sort of see that generally uh, the recruiting for regiments takes about two or three months. Then they fill uh, their ranks and then they go down to uh, Camp William Penn to be trained. So let's look at um, the number of USCT men uh, by their state of birth. This is also included uh, in their service records. Men who enlisted in Northwest Pennsylvania were born in 25 different states and countries. And as can be seen, our men were not all born in Northern states. Most of the men were born in five states, Kentucky with 90 men, Virginia, 45 men, Tennessee, 36, Pennsylvania, 25, and Ohio at 18. These five states account for 75% of the men the top three states were all slave states, Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee, and they accounted for 60% of the men. Pennsylvania only accounted for 9% of the men. Were any of the men who enlisted in Waterford or Meadville former slaves? Yes, they were. Of the pension records we collected, 21 pension records were from men who were born in slaveholding states. 16 of these men, 70%, 76%, specifically stated they were slaves before they enlisted. The remaining five did not report anything regarding slavery for those men we just don't know. For men that we don't have pension records for, we would have to infer that if you came from a slave state, it's highly likely that you were a slave. In this case, a little over 200 of our men. How did they get here? Let's look at one man's journey. But through John Stringer's pension record, we were able to piece together how he got to Waterford. John Stringer was a slave in Shelby County, Tennessee in 18... 63 September, he ran away from his master and made his way to Chattanooga and the Union Army. While in Chattanooga, he links up with the 40th Indiana and while there he meets another former slave, Logan Crisp. They both become cooks for different companies in the regiment. For the five months he's with the 40th Indiana, he has been with them through numerous engagements, the Battle of Chickamauga, Lookout Mountain, and Missionary Ridge. So he has some experience with the army. 
In February 1864, the 40th Indiana travels home for furlough and Stringer, Crisp, Presley Cheek, and another former slave go along. While in Indianapolis, Stringer and the rest are met by a Pennsylvania recruiter who arranges transportation to Cleveland and then to Waterford, Pennsylvania. So the, again, this is all derived from John Stringer's pension record and gives a pretty clear uh, indication of how he got to Waterford. Now, there are some general observations based on the pension records. When you start looking at them, you start seeing some trends. And here's some of them. Uh, these men did not wait passively to be freed by Union troops. These men took active steps to escape slavery and took risks doing so. They ran off and often found other slaves that they joined up with. These slaves often linked up with other with Union regiments that were operating nearby. At times, they offered their services to these regiments, often as cooks or servants. This informal service often led to eventual enlistment in the USCT regiments, and John Stringer's journey was through this method. Now, Confederate masters or their sons took some of our men with them as personal servants when they fought for the Confederacy. In our pension records, both Confederate officers and enlisted men took slaves with them to war, and our men escaped from these Confederate soldiers when they had the opportunity. And finally, Union towns across river borders of free and slave states were popular destinations for escaping slaves and recruiters. A good example of this is Evanston, Indiana, across the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky. Before the war, Evanston was a major hub in the Underground Railroad, and this is well known. From the pension records, a number of our men came through uh, Evanston. Was Erie County actively recruiting slaves in Confederate states? Yes, they were. Recruiters were sent outside of Northwest Pennsylvania to find men who would come here to enlist and be counted against its draft quotas. Some of these recruiters were officers from the USCT regiments that were being raised. Others were army officers whose job was as a recruiter. Some were the recruiting agents for the provost marshals. Other recruiters were civilians operating at the request or on the authority of the local government. Erie County provides an example of how agents were used to recruit Confederate in Confederate states. This document signed by Pennsylvania Governor Curtin on August 2nd, 1864, designates Mr. Richard Boas as recruiting agent on behalf of Erie County for the states of Georgia and Alabama. He left for Atlanta shortly after being appointed. Not much was reported in the papers after that, and this needs to be investigated further. The Erie Weekly Gazette reported on August 18th, 1864, that three men from Erie County who had traveled to Fortress Monroe, Virginia to recruit black men had returned empty-handed. The paper stated that Quote, contrabands are reported to be scarce and in great demand in that quarter. Agents from the Eastern states and New York are there thick as buzzards around a carrion. So again, it's very difficult um, to find these recruits. At least that was experience of, of these Erie agents. Monetary incentive, black men were eligible for bounties. Black men were eligible for the same federal bounties as white men, and this did provide some incentives. The usual federal bounty is $300 for a three-year term of enlistment. As a further incentive, local governments, such as counties and townships, offer their own bounties that would be offered in addition to federal bounties. Did our men get bounties? Yes, they did. The service records do indicate that 150 men, or over half, enlisted with the promise of federal bounties. According to the service records, nine men received $200 bounties from Crawford County, Benango County and Mercer County each offered $200 bounties to one recruit apiece. This article appeared in the August 25th, 1864 edition of the Erie Weekly Gazette. It shows that Erie County did send a recruiting agent, Mr. John Haldeman to Fortress Monroe to recruit former slaves and that he was going to be provided an Erie bounty. However, as this article describes, other, agents, other states also sent recruiting agents and prepared to offer higher bounties than Erie County. Erie County did not get any recruits from this trip. In July, 1864, it became allowable for blacks to serve as substitutes for whites. This came at a good time since commutation was limited in, in, eliminated in July, 1864. Remember, a commutation allowed a drafted conscript to pay $300 to avoid service. Now, the only option to avoid service was to find a substitute. This July 4th, 1864 letter from Provost Marshal Hugh Campbell is informing the public that black men can now be used as substitutes for white men. 
and did this in fact happen? From the service records, these USCT recruits were credited. Um, yes. Yes, and as it turns out, they did. Crawford County had 17 substitutes or 34% of the substitutes uh, that um, were generated at this time. Erie only had four, which was 8%. So Crawford, Venango were really the primary um, counties that um, at least had black men serve as substitutes in Northwest Pennsylvania. Where were these men credited to satisfy conscription quotas? From the service records, these USCT recruits were credited to local townships and by extension to local counties to satisfy recruitment quotas. The majority of the service records are very specific in stating where to assign credit to these men. This table shows the number of men who are credited to each county. And as we can see, nearly half the men were credited to Erie County. This makes sense since most of the men enlisted in Waterford. And we can drill down even further with this map. This map shows the spatial distribution of where our men's enlistments were credited by township. And note the now large number of townships in Erie County that had men credited to them. Did any black men living in Erie County in 1860 serve in USCT regiments? Yes, we used the 1860 census of Erie County to help answer this question, as George mentioned earlier. The 1860 census showed that 97 black men lived in Erie County. Only 45 of these would have been of ages appropriate to enlist. 13 of these had exemptions. Of the remaining 32 men, 24 men who were in the 1860 census, I'm sorry, yeah, 13 of these had exemptions. Of the remaining 32 men, 24 men who were in the 1860 census were not in the 1870 census. So we covered five men. William Titus was the earliest to enlist and he joined the 54th Massachusetts in April, 1863. Unfortunately, he came down with dropsy or general inflammation of the body and he died in Reedville, Pennsylvania, uh, Reedville, Massachusetts. He never left the training camp. William Chrysler and David Jacobs both enlisted as substitutes after the provost marshal announced that black men could substitute for white men. Erie County had two black men who were drafted James Davis and Jeremiah McConnell. They were drafted near the very end of the war. Davis was drafted in Ridgeway after the Provost Marshal moved his office there from Waterford. McConnell was not drafted into a USCT regiment, was placed in a white regiment, the 98th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. And how is this possible? He is listed in the 1860 census as mulatto. So perhaps as part of the answer, we really don't know for sure how this happened. Three of the five men uh, are buried in Erie County. William Titus is buried in Reedville, Massachusetts, and David Jacobs is buried in Sandusky, Ohio. We also identified two men who served in the Union Navy, James Grant and Henry Burley Sr. More on them later. And let's just look uh, a little bit more closely at one of these men, William Chrysler, uh, who enlisted in the 127th USCT. He was a resident of Union Township, and the thing that really stands out here is the discrepancy in the ages between the 1860 census and his Army service record. According to the census, he would have been 57 years old when he enlisted, but according to his service record, he would have been 42 years old. He would have definitely been too old to enlist at 57, which is correct. And let's see. So I, from his service records, we're able to sort of piece together uh, what happened to William Chrysler. And this is his Civil War. Uh, he enlisted in August 1864 in Meadville in the 127th Regiment. He trained at Camp William Penn. And while he was there, he got sick with fever and dysentery. He was at a camp hospital from November 1864 to February 1865 for four months, either sick or serving as an attendant. He rejoined his regiment just in time for the fall of Richmond and the, and the surrender of General Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia in April 1865. He got sick again in May 1865 and went to the hospital at Fortress Monroe, Virginia. The Civil War is now over, but many black regiments were sent to the Texas-Mexico border for border patrol, and the 127th was one of these regiments. Chrysler gets out of the hospital and goes to the regiment to Texas, where he gets sick again, resulting in hospitalization at New Orleans and Baltimore, and finally gets discharged for disability. In Chrysler's certificate for disability, he admits that his age is 59, and the doctors conclude that he's suffering from general disability caused by old age. So he was really 57 uh, when he enlisted, and that may account for the amount of illness that he, that he had. 
and what happened to the men who came through Northwest Pennsylvania. The most common outcome was that the men survived the war and mustered out with their companies, nearly 60%. 39 men died, 14% of the men mustered, 36 of illness in the hospital. The ratio of death by disease to combat deaths by these men was roughly nine to one. 11% of our men deserted, which is comparable uh, to the white regiments. And I'm gonna turn this back over to George uh, for the last part of the talk. Thanks, Brian. Well, we mentioned uh, not only were uh, black men serving in the army, but they were also serving in the Navy. Um, if you look closely at this photograph um, of the USS Miami, there are a number of uh, black faces you'll see scattered throughout the crew. One very interesting thing that the um, uh, Navy did, which started to recruit black men um, uh, in the late 1700s, unlike the Army, is it never recorded, um, at least up to the Civil War, um, the race. So uh, those of us that have studied Perry's fleet, we believe somewhere between 10 and 20% of the men in Perry's fleet um, were of African descent, but um, except for one or two names, we could never prove it uh, because uh, the Navy just didn't care. You know, uh, all men were created equal, quite frankly, in the Navy. Um, there was an official prohibition in uh, 1789 against blacks in the Navy, it was never enforced. In 1813, uh, there was an act that integrated the Navy. And um, as I mentioned, the uh, records are, raci uh, are racially neutral, between 15 and 20% perhaps of the entire Navy in the War of 1812 was black. At the start of the Civil War, um, approximately 5%. Um, however, there was heavy recruiting for the rapidly expanding Navy. Nearly 18,000 uh, served. Um, that's 23% approximately of the, um, uh, of the uh, of sailors, uh, 1,200 from Pennsylvania. And home port in Erie was the USS Michigan, um, which served as an important recruiting station. Next. So a couple of men that we know served out of Erie. Uh, one was uh, James Grant. Um, he volunteered, um, born in Erie in 1843, lived in the East Ward, worked as a waiter. Um, his uh, naval service is um, at least another thousand men from the Erie area. He enlisted on the Michigan, um, and he actually enlisted twice. He had two separate services. Um, he served on a total of seven ships, um, both in the South Atlantic and Gulf blockading stations. Um, he lived uh, in Chicago. Um, after the war in, uh, from about 1880 to his death in 1916. Next. This name will ring a bell to a lot of people. Um, Harry Burley, the uh, uh, famous um, composer who also is really considered the savior of the, um, of the black spiritual, the black gospel. Um, this is his dad, Harry Thacker Burley Sr. He was born in Boston in 1836. He moved to Erie um, around 1860. Um, he, was a, he was an activist. Um, he uh, actively worked with black citizens, Hamilton Waters and the Bosberg family against slavery and for equal rights. He helped create and develop the first colored school in Erie and he became its first superintendent. In 1862, he married um, Hamilton Waters' daughter um, his naval service was from 1864 to 1865, and um, he would father then um, uh, the Harry Burley that we are so familiar with. Next. Um, he continued as a racial pioneer, and he would become the first black juror in Erie County. He mustered into the uh, Grand Army of the Republic uh, Strong Vincent Post which was the um, post-war army um, or uh, military association like the American Legion or um, the VFW is today. He was the first black man to uh, be mustered into that post. 
um, he'd become a conductor, which was a uh, actually a pretty high position on the Lakeshore Railway and the Michigan Southern Railway. He died on the job in Chicago in 1873 at the age of 36, would be buried here in the Erie Cemetery. His son would become, as I mentioned, one of the most important composers of, in America and the savior of the black spiritual. Um, Harry Burley Sr. served on the Tin Clad Moose. Its sister ship, the Rattler, is um, as pictured here, um, served in the interior waters, what was called the Brown Water Navy. Next. One of the phenomenon of the uh, experience of uh, black troops in the Civil War was there were no officers. Um, the highest you could uh, attain would be a, a sergeant, master sergeant in the army, but all of the um, USC regiments were officered by white men. Unlike state volunteer units, um, men uh, would have to apply um, for, the, uh, for the position instead of being appointed voted in by their fellow soldiers or appointed by the governor, these men had to take a test for competence and knowledge. A lot of um, young men who were serving in white regiments would um, uh, want to become officers and this was their vehicle in spite of the dangers that they would have had um, if they had been captured by the Confederates. Um, they were enlisted men really wanting to move up. The man pictured here, Oliver Wilcox Norton, he was a private in the uh, 83rd Pennsylvania, would be the first man to sound taps as the bugler of the 83rd. Um, he would later apply for and become a uh, lieutenant and later quartermaster of the 8th USCT. Saw combat both in Florida and in Virginia. Next. What happens after the war to uh, many of these men? Well, the Soldier and Sailor's Home in Erie, which is the of Ash Street, um, would become the first soldier's home in Pennsylvania um, when it was founded in 1886 and uh, was one of six in, for Pennsylvania, but the first. Um, it is still maintained today as a modern facility caring for the needs of the aging veteran population. From the very start, it was an integrated facility, something very progressive for its time. The beautiful chapel contains wonderful stained glass windows as a memorial of the Civil War soldiers. The four acre veteran cemetery is a final resting place for over 1300 men and women dating from the Civil War era today, including graves of former members of the USCT. Next slide. Um, there are many human interest stories and I found this one in particular very poignant. This is Jerry Jackson, um, the story of Jerry Jackson um, and his widow. Um, the case of her trying to establish that she was legally married to Jerry Jackson. Um, Jerry Jackson had been a member of the uh, uh, at the Soldier and Sailor's Home. Widows, black or white, had to prove their marriages to the pension board by getting affidavits from the minister who conducted the ceremony, other witnesses, or even sending in their marriage certificates. The problem with slave marriages is that they weren't legally recognized in the South and almost never recorded. This is a letter in the file by her stating that she was a free woman, but he was a slave when they were married in December 24th of 1864 in Frederick County, Maryland. In the pension file is a nice letter by a neighbor he saw the soldier and his wife at the train station of Frederick when he was going off to war. The son of the man who owned Jerry uh, stated that he knew him and of the marriage. He really seemed to like Jerry. There are many letters from white people who knew Jerry as a slave. After the war, they moved to Pennsylvania, and although she claimed 15 children from the marriage, it was fraught with separations, including when he moved to the Pennsylvania Soldier and Sailor's Home. While there, he wrote several letters addressing her as his dear wife, signing her as her, her affectionate husband, and pleaded with her to join him in Erie, but she apparently had taken up with another man and refused to come. The sad irony is that after his death in 1899, she used those very letters from him to press her uh, claim as a legal wife in order to receive his pensions. There are many dozens of interesting stories of, of African-American men who served their country contained the pension, medical, and service records we have amassed 
at the Erie County Historical Society archives. Um, soon after the pandemic is over, we'll be open for appointment once again. And we really welcome researchers to use our facilities. You can find us at eriehistory.org, eriehistory.org. And Brian, I'll turn it back over to you um, for conclusions. Okay. Yeah, I want to just uh, wrap up with some conclusions. Um, first, again, I'd like to thank everyone for um, their interest in this uh, presentation. I'd also like to thank um, George for giving me the opportunity to work on this project. It's been something that really uh, has meant a lot to me over the last few years, and I've learned a lot uh, by working on the project and by working with uh, George and Jeff. Okay, so conclusions. Um, Black troops played a significant role in the Civil War. Pennsylvania contributed a large number of Black men in USCT regiments. 286 men came through Northwest Pennsylvania based on active recruitment outside the region to fill the Black regiments, and most of these recruits were from slaveholding states. The draft was a major driver in the recruitment of Black men to serve in Black regiments to help satisfy the draft quotas. Local Black men did serve, even though the numbers of local Black men were few. We covered Black sailors in the Union Navy, and described two local Erie men who enlisted. And finally, we concluded with a brief overview of USCT soldiers in the Pennsylvania Soldiers and Sailors Home. And if there's any questions um, that you'd like to direct to George or I, you know, we provided our email addresses at the bottom and you can email us and, and contact us if you'd like to um, discuss any of this any further. And I guess that about wraps it up. Thank you. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you. I, I have a, a brief question. Uh, during my preliminary research at the start of this project with Brian, you took over. Um, what we began to notice, and Brian and I and George have talked about this, on the service records is the line that says, where credited, which you don't see on pre-draft uh, service records. They don't ask whether that's credited. So I think we started to see a trend that the, these men were not necessarily, and then we found out they were born in Kentucky, but they were credited to you know, a township in Erie County or Crawford County. So that sort of turned the project a, a little bit in a different direction, didn't it? Yeah, I, I, I guess I could say, uh, I, when I came to this project, I knew uh, I had very little background on the USCT and how they were formed. And so for me, I, I guess it was more of a data-driven exercise, like how I learned about what was going on was really by uh, collecting the data and then let the data sort of drive the research. Um, and then and later on, as you do the reading, you realize, okay, what is happening here uh, conforms with what's in the literature as well. So, but, it, but you're right, there were some red flags that indicated, hey, the, all, the, all these men were not all local. A lot of them right. came somewhere else, and a lot of them came from slaveholding states, which was really sort of exciting when you think about it, you know, we had a number of men who had their beginnings, um, their beginnings of freedom coming through Waterford or Meadville, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from slaveholding states. That's, that's actually pretty exciting, at least to me. Yes, it is. And George and I, I know we, we spoke about that and you and I did that this may have changed the direction, but it doesn't change the fact that this is a terribly interesting story that has really not been dug into by historians. George, yeah. you have anything to add to that? Well, I just want to say um, to follow up on your thought about being interesting to historians, we have, and I mentioned this earlier, we have this massive amount of information and we have just basically uh, touched on much of it. There are dozens of really interesting stories. There are um, uh, stories to be further followed up. Um, you know, a, a college student who wants to write a really interesting paper, perhaps even, again, a dissertation um, is in the documents that we have here. So I'd encourage anybody um, who is listening, who wants to find out more, we've got, the, we've got this massive amount of information. If they are a student or know a student that they want to give a really interesting story to, um, you know, this is one that I really encourage as a, as a historian author myself, that um, boy, this is, um, 
this can really uh, uh, be uh, much more deeply developed than what uh, we've been able to do so far. Well, exactly. And the, the contribution of the African-American soldiers in the Civil War is something that, uh, as Brian said, the film Glory first brought to light, but there's so much more to it. It isn't just the 54th Massachusetts. And these men are truly a testament to their patriotism and their service to our country. Uh, at this point, we have no questions from the audience. So I would ask anyone who's interested to send either George or Brian an email with your questions if you have any. And I would like to thank George, Brian, and Sarah Little, our tech support, and to all of you who watch tonight online. Our next speaker will be on Wednesday, February 10th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Brandon Wiley, founder and executive director of Open Eyes, will talk and his talk will be live on Facebook and later on YouTube, as will this talk be on YouTube. And on Tuesday, February 16th at 7 p.m., George will present for the Jefferson Educational Society and the Erie Civil War Roundtable. This program entitled Raid, Murder, and Retribution, the Destruction of the Weldon Railroad, December 1864. George, that sounds like a, a novel title there. That, that's, that ought to grab people. <laughs> this talk will be available through the Jefferson Society. Gentlemen, I thank you very much for speaking tonight and thank you to the audience. And I'm gonna say good night. Good night, thank you.